first of all, I want to thank I want to thank you all for coming to the 16th annual Yadida Kalfan Stillman Memorial Lecture. I'm Alan Levinson. I'm the director of the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies here at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, before introducing uh, tonight's speaker, uh, I'd like to say a couple of words uh, in honor of uh, the late Yadida Kalfan Stillman, who uh, was beloved by many people and who was a friend to some of the people in the audience. I had the privilege of meeting her at the Association of Jewish Studies, but I cannot say that I knew her. Uh, and there are, are other people here, uh, but they elected to let me uh, speak uh, a little bit about her. Yadida, uh, as uh, uh, Norman Noam Stillman always referred to her, uh, Yadida by first name, she was a uh, very eminent professor of uh, Arabic, of uh, Arab folk culture, of uh, Palestinian uh, dress, uh, of uh, Moroccan uh, uh, ethnography and ethno-cultural practices, but uh, uh, she was a very warm and uh, uh, much beloved person. She grew, she was born in Fez, uh, Morocco, and uh, came as a young girl to Israel, where she spent a year in a uh, uh, a tent city, a Ma'abara, which was not at all unusual. Uh, at that time, she grew up in Jerusalem, received her first degree in folk literature from the Hebrew University, uh, and then went uh, to work for the Israel Museum. She got her MA and her doctorate uh, in Oriental <coughs> Studies at the University of Pennsylvania in 1972. Uh, and uh, met and married and had a, uh, a very happy marriage uh, to Norman uh, Stillman until her uh, untimely death in 1998 from cancer. Uh, in uh, her uh, unfortunately, tragically short life, um, she not only uh, accomplished a great deal as a scholar, uh, but as a teacher, had many, many students, and I heard from Noam uh, just this morning, actually, or the night there, that um, uh, he wishes he could be here, and uh, says that Mark may be the first speaker we've had who uh, Yadida did not know personally, although uh, Noam recommended Mark's work to me, uh, and uh, very much uh, Professor Wagner uh, works in this uh, great tradition, uh, uh, great, great tradition. In any event, um, uh, Yadida also was, uh, in addition to being a great scholar, was uh, a wife and a mother of two, uh, Anon Stillman and Mia Tabak Stillman, uh, who are uh, well and have families of their own. <coughs> I want to now uh, introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, Professor Mark Wagner, a uh, native of Chicago, who uh, I had the pleasure of getting to know a little bit today. And uh, Professor Wagner uh, received his BA from Vassar College, which if you know that nice area of Westchester, uh, uh, it's uh, just a little about an hour, hour and a half north of New York City. Maybe two. Maybe two, okay. And uh, then went on and earned uh, uh, an MA uh, and a PhD at uh, New York University in classical Arabic literature, Arabic vernacular literature, and Islamic law. Uh, he and his family live in New Orleans, and he has managed to keep in a coastal commute uh, even in the Midwest, uh, because he teaches at Louisiana State University, which, in case you didn't know, is in Baton Rouge, not New Orleans. I didn't know that. His uh, specialty, uh, in addition to Islamic law and Islamic Jewish relations and uh, Arabic vernacular, is especially concerning the Yemenite uh, Jewish community, 
which uh, very famously was dubbed by Shlomo Dov Goitain, one of the great pioneers of the study of Mizrahi uh, Jewry, as both the most Arab and the most Jewish of all Jews. Uh, and Professor Wagner uh, published a, a book like Joseph uh, in Beauty, Yemeni Vernacular Poetry, an Arab-Jewish Symbiosis, this came out in 2009 uh, from Leiden uh, Brill Press, one of the best European presses, which uh, those of us who deal in European history or Middle Eastern history know very well. Uh, and uh, just uh, this, I guess, past year, 2014 or 2015, uh, came out with this book, Jews and Islamic Law in Early 20th Century Yemen. Uh, Professor Wagner has also published uh, about a dozen uh, or more uh, peer-reviewed articles, uh, which is very impressive because quite a few of them clearly do not overlap these two books. So he's a, a, a very accomplished, a very young, I might say, uh, yet very accomplished uh, researcher and publisher. Uh, he's also um, a very committed teacher, We've talked a lot about teaching today. Uh, and mostly what he teaches at Louisiana State University uh, are, are courses in Arabic language, uh, Arabic culture, and occasionally, I won't do justice to it, but basically Israeli and Arabic culture in the Middle Eastern setting. And uh, we're very delighted that he's come today to talk to us about Jewish lawyers in Islamic courts. <coughs> so, without further ado, Professor Wagner. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to basically talk about the story behind how I. Uh, the story behind how I got to write this, came to write this book. Um, so it has a lot of uh, first person in it, which is uh, a little bit, a little bit un unusual. Um, and it includes some some material that I. Uh, there was a lot of there there were a lot of things I was not able to uh, to include in the book because uh, books apparently academic books are meant to be relatively short, or at least this is what the publishers tell us. So, so I, I was left with a lot, um, a lot of, uh, a lot left over, and this, so this comes from that. Um, so, uh, assessing the legal and social status of non-Muslims in Muslim countries represents one of the most hotly contested endeavors in Arabic and Islamic studies. Uh, for example, the most extensive study on the subject by Antoine Fatal in 1958 is today cited mainly in popular conservative circles. Simultaneously, the depiction of Islam's attitude towards its minorities is as uniformly benevolent. Also the product of an early phase in research has come to dominate academic treatments of the subject. Moreover, when the non-Muslims in question are the Jews of the Arab world, most of whom relocated to Israel in the early 50s, this question becomes coupled with the even more charged political climate surrounding the discussion of Zionism. Um, I was first tempted to get involved in this mess, or maybe that involved is not the right word, but uh, uh, overcome my better judgment. Uh, while a graduate student at NYU in 2002, uh, I had spent four months in Yemen where I collected a respectable set of microfilm, microfilm copies of Arabic manuscripts and developed a working knowledge of the local dialect in preparation for writing my dissertation on a genre of poetry that Arabs and Jews from Yemen shared. One evening in the Elmer Holmes Bobst Library Jewish History Stacks, a three-volume set of glossy new hardbacks drew my attention away from the book I was actually looking for. This is a pleasure which today's digital world has rendered almost obsolete. <laughs> it bore the exceptionally dull title, The Synagogues of Sana'a, the Capital of Yemen, three volumes. And it was chock full of reproductions of sloppily handwritten, smudged Islamic court documents in Arabic that the author, a man named Shalom Saad Yagamliel, 
had brought with him upon emigrating to Israel and self-published in his house. Uh, with much of my doctoral dissertation in another field still left to be written, I felt a bit like Walker Percy, who, when first confronted with the sole, nearly legible copy of John Kennedy Toole's Confederacy of Dunces, confessed, there was no getting out of it. Only one hope, re hope remained, that I could read a few pages and that they would be bad enough for me in good conscience to read no farther. Usually I can do just that. Indeed, the first paragraph often suffices. My only fear was that this one might not be bad enough, or might be just good enough so that I would have to keep reading. In this case, I read on and on, first with the sinking feeling that it was not bad enough to quit, then with a prickle of interest, and then a growing excitement, and finally an incredulity. Surely it was not possible that it was so good. Far from being as dull as the title suggested, the documents and the author's asides told the rollicking story of bribe-taking Islamic judges perjury, intrigue, and two bitterly opposed factions within the Jewish community of Yemen who were ruthless and clever in using the Sharia courts to their respective advantage. It turned out that the book was the last in a long series of document collections that Gamaliel had published. In addition to these, aging Yemenite Jews in Israel had written some 60 memoirs about their youth in Yemen, and almost always had something valuable to say about the Islamic legal system, if only because the scene of a Jew taking his or her case to a Muslim court was both inherently dramatic and very common. I also found that a number of Muslim Yemenis who lived through the tumultuous events of the mid-20th century had written memoirs which I was able to use to cross-reference some of the various episodes that, I, that the Jewish sources described. Having sorted through this material, three Jewish men, one of whom was Gamaliel, emerged as de facto fixers within the Jewish community. These men were wealthy, argumentative, knew formal Arabic well, and had close connections to the Muslim aristocracy. While Islamic law does not technically involve lawyers, uh, these men were, for all intents and purposes, lawyers. I was particularly struck by the manner in which they found legal loopholes or stratagems that allowed them to flout the norms of humble Jewish decorum in a Muslim society. While Jews were forbidden from riding horses or mules in the Islamic State, Gamaliel bought a bicycle in 1931 and spent the next six years in and out of the Sharia courts lobbying for his rights to ride it through the narrow streets of the Muslim city. Uh, through bribes, forgery, and an elaborate sting operation, another fixer got away with having a Muslim judge brutally beaten in 1939. Uh, two years later, he arranged for the ruler of Yemen's retinue to be met with a novel display as it passed his hometown. A flag of his own design that depicted the regime's symbols of Islamic legitimacy, namely the crescent moon, stars, and sword of the caliphs, with a Zionist star of David in its center. Several Muslim judges objected to the flag, but the Jew lobbied the ruler for the right to hoist it and won. Across Bobst Library's vast and vertiginous atrium, in the Isla Islamic law section lay thousands of legal manuals in Arabic, almost all of which describe hypothetical situations in which Jews come into contact with the Muslim legal system, Jews or other non-Muslims. Uh, others consisted of abstruse treatises on legal philosophy. Yet these largely described what ought to happen rather than what actually happened. Uh, in the Islamic world, the archiving of legal documents, as opposed to legal manuals, did not begin into a, until a re relatively recent period, by and large. Uh, thus, I had gathered information that would enable me to dig one unusually deep exploratory trench. Uh, at that time, shortly after the attacks of September 11th, one of the most prominent scholars of Islamic law, Wael Halak, announced that there had been a, quote, near total revolution in Islamic legal studies, especially during the last two decades, that had led to, quote, scholarship somewhat freer from the cult cultural assumptions of domination. Following in the footsteps of Edward Said, Halak had spearheaded the charge against the founding fathers of Islamic legal studies, chief among them Ignaz Goldzier and Joseph Schacht. 
Against the purported European chauvinism of the Orientalists, the new orthodoxy offered a positively glowing assessment of Islamic law, its practitioners, and the odds of marginalized groups finding justice within it. Indeed, if one believes much of the new scholarship on Islamic law, the challenges to the legal status quo mounted by the three Jewish fixers of Yemen were unnecessary and quixotic. The new scholarship emphasizes Islamic law's flexibility and responsiveness to change. It also emphasizes the central role of independent jurists and judges, as well as their erudition in Islam's majestic and complex legal philosophy. The language of the new scholarship encodes certain value judgments, which, while perhaps secondary or unintentional, nevertheless portray a legal system that always does an admirable, jo admirable job. For example, Chaim Gerber describes, quote, a practical jurist at work struggling to accommodate the most unexpected cases to the body of law. In my view, it took a man of superior intelligence to produce such a collection of judicial opinions. For Gerber, Muslim jurists were not only very smart, they were also scrupulously ethical. Quote, the principle embedded in the work of the jurists is sincere devotion to the basic values of Islamic law, albeit with a fair measure of common sense flexibility, he writes. In a similar vein, Judith Tucker says, quote, the jurists took a pragmatic and liberal approach insofar as they were ready to accommodate various social and economic changes of the time. In Wael Halak's can the Sharia be restored? The pre-modern jurists brought to bear, quote, great experience and great learning, a, quote, arsenal of legal knowledge, and, quote, sensitivity to social reality to specific situations. The so-called legal reforms of the 19th and 20th centuries, which were, quote, massive, drastic, and destructive, dismantled this, quote, self-sufficient system. In addition to the romanticization of the past and the, understandable, and the understandable and arguably desirable sympathy for and identification with the subjects he is writing about, uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, the sense in Halak's writing that the jurists seem very much like, uh, like academics in a university who's flourishing a small-minded administrative bureaucracy gradually and inexorably curtails. Uh, these studies of Islamic law lavish praise upon the system itself, as in Halak's description of a self-sufficient system. Gerber says, the liveliness and intellectual vigor of Islamic law is unmistakable. The greatest greatness of the Islamic system of legal thought lies in its ability to think in terms of both the general and the specific. Uh, the generalized, uh, uh, he speaks of basic values of Islamic law, by which he means ethical obligations. The generalized jurist often uses these to ensure that the outcome of a given legal proceeding lives up to these principles. He writes, the rule is again relaxed out of consideration of Islamic values of compassion for the weak and the needy. Such scholarship locates the system's ethical fail-safes in the methodological tools at the jurist's disposal. On the topic of independent legal reasoning, Halak says, the same system that produced and maintained legal pluralism also produced the means to deal with the difficulties that this pluralism presented. Uh, the same uh, Gerber just judges another jurist's tool judicial preference, and there's, there are uh, Arabic technical terms for all of these, um, these methods, as, quote, a major avenue for the quiet introduction of socially desirable innovations. Such statements call to mind the Syrian philosopher Sadiq Jalal al-Azam's mem memorable formulation that a good jurist is by definition a bad Muslim. If religion and its literal expression does not accord with what is right in a given situation, it must not be taken literally. The idea that a humanistic inclination towards the fair resolution of real conflicts underpin that was underpinning Muslim jurists' rulings over and against competing dictates of the religious life holds a certain emotional appeal, but it is in the end indefensible. While there were good jurists who were bad Muslims, sure, surely there were also hanging judges who were good Muslims as well, and probably there were quite a range in between the two poles. 
Another prominent scholar of Islamic law, Sherman Jackson, begins to, began to devote serious attention to the power dynamics of the law in some of his work. He correctly noted that the philosophy of law in Islam is emphatically formalistic. Uh, the enduring appeal of formalism, or the idea that law derives solely from doctrine, is dramatized in the American public sphere each time a Supreme Court nominee assures Congress that he or she will apply the law without any interpretive agenda whatsoever. Uh, that's, that's formalism. Uh, uh, I, I will only do what the Constitution says. Uh, looking back at the information, information I collected on minutiae ranging from the amounts of various bribes to the political affiliation of particular judges, strong friendships, bitter rival, business rivalries, and the physical conditions in the jails, I decided to distance myself from this type of civilizational polemic where the noblest achievements of one civilization are contrasted with the worst abuses of the West, and in, or of the other. And since 9-11, the opposite approach has proliferated a great deal in trade publishing and, and on the internet. I needed an, an approach that would do justice to the subtleties that I was beginning to understand, as well as a less, less enthusiastic language to describe them. I found some inspiration in a generation of legal scholarship that emerged in America at the same time the Jewish fixers were showing up in court in Yemen. This was American legal realism, as represented by Felix Cohen, who in a provocative 1935 Law Review article described the technical language of the law as so much transcendental nonsense. Quote, washed in cynical acid, every legal problem can be interpreted as a question concerning the positive behavior of judges. Legal philosopher Brian Leiter writes, quote, the core claim of realism is that judges reach decisions based on what they think would be fair on the facts of the case, rather than on the basis of the applicable rules of law. Realists accept the, pre the basic premise that it is, quote, primarily the non-legal underlying facts of the case rather than the rules of law that trigger the response or the verdict. One of the handful of scholars of Islamic law to show an interest in legal realism is Sherman Jackson. Um, yet even his work shows continuity with the formalistic uh, uh, mode. He describes the tools, the jurist tools, vaguely articul articulated broader interests and compelling interests as remedies for situations, quote, where the community was found in need of provisions not explicitly stated in the law, or where the strict application of a rule stood to undermine its overall intent, cause undue hardship, or obliterate a legitimate interest. Uh, one is left with the impression that the tools of Islamic law, in and of themselves, protect people who interact with the legal system against excessive severity, cruelty, or partiality. Uh, the question of who is, and more, and who, more importantly, who is not included under the rubric of, rubric of the community arises as well. Uh, in the recent work that aims primarily to compare Western and Islamic legal systems, Jackson describes the, quote, equality of respect that undergirded the Muslim state's stance toward non-Muslims. While he is correct that in his observation of a high degree of consistency across time and geographical boundaries in Muslims allowing non-Muslims to practice their religion, it is unclear what, if any, evidence supports the idea that this stemmed from respect or, or any other lovely emotional uh, uh, influences. Uh, arguing in the same vein, Halak argues on the basis of only ten cases from Ottoman Turkey that non-Muslims in Islamic courts, which by their very nature supported the underdog, won the great, great majority of cases. And he goes on to say, non-Muslims and women's rights, as well as their actual legal and social powers, were no more disadvantaged than their Muslim male counterparts. Was this true in the cases he cites? I don't know, nor am I certain that one could know. Uh, given the available evidence. However, I do know that in Yemen, Jews, Jews faced significant disadvantages with, while interacting with the Islamic legal system, which, it should be added, was generally something to be avoided by Muslims as well. Most of these were not specific only to Yemen either. 
Uh, a Muslim's testimony possessed a higher evidentiary value than that of a Jew. Jews were technically forbidden from learning the Islamic jargon that was used in the court. A Jew's ability to own immovable property, build or repair a synagogue, or execute a simple bequest all rested on ambiguous and rather flimsy legal rationales. Their very bodies conveyed ritual impurity. These make the individual accomplishments of the Jewish fixers all the more remarkable, as well as explaining the modesty of their scope. In some cases, Jews were able to use their apparent weakness in the legal system against their Muslim opponents. In 1927, Gamliel was accused of public drunkenness. Uh, Jews, were, Jews made wine and brandy, uh, and, and, and they always sold it to Muslims, but they're not allowed to do that. And there's sort of periodic crackdowns on that, and they were also not allowed to, to be drunk in public. Uh, <clears throat> One of the classic Islamic legal manuals, and one which ought to have been the main reference for the court in question, required the accuser to testify that to smelling alcohol on the accused's breath. Uh, therefore, uh, at, towards the end of the trial, Gamaliel insisted that his accuser admit to have gotten close enough to kiss him, which elicited peals of laughter from the Muslim audience to the trial. Rather than endure that particular humiliation, the Muslim withdrew his charge. Uh, another fixer prepared a statement in flowery and grammatically accurate Arabic to be read aloud in court by his accomplice, a Jew of very low social status, the, the son of a potter. But rather than upbraid him for his outrageous usurpation of the language of Muslim erudition, the court was amused by the ridiculous spectacle, and he, he won his case. In what is otherwise one of the most bracingly critical assessments of Islamic legal theory, Jackson offers two contradictory uh, definitions of juristic tools in rapid succession. They are simply ways, quote, to justify divergence from formalist readings, which I think is true. Uh, uh, alternatively, they are, quote, safety net principles whose apparent aim is to reverse the negative or unanticipated effects of a strictly formalist, formalist reading. Uh, uh, the idea that this is a safety net that catches, uh, that catches the negative suggests that the legal system and its functionaries were fair by nature. In the 18th century, Muhammad Ali Shalkani, the most prominent Muslim judge in Yemen, managed to convince the authorities that the compelling interest in maintaining basic sanitation required Jews to collect and dispose of human feces and dead animals in cities. Uh, and it, I have to go into the sort of sanitation of a typical Ye Yemeni house to explain how this works. So uh, if, if you're interested, I can elaborate. Um, uh, that Muslims had previously been, been involved in this was an affront to their supremacy, in his opinion. Uh, this was the norm until the Jews' mass, mass immigration to Israel. Uh, today, Shalkani is lionized in scholarship as an exemplar of Islamic reform, that is, the successful merger of Islamic law with modern conditions. And no one brings this up in that context, I should say that. Um, it is also worth noting that quite a few Muslim jurists in Yemen stood up to him and argued that making the Jews collect feces was cruel and reprehensible. Uh, the ostensibly anti-Orientalist scholarship on Islamic law is itself in need of some correction. Um, always given the, giving the jurists of the past the benefit of the doubt obfuscates the question of power, as does its romanticization of the pre-modern at the expense of the modern. Uh, this approach paradoxically stresses the importance of social change or flexibility over and against fixed texts on a rhetorical level all the while preserving an official perspective by essentially drawing only on these, these uh, authoritative texts, these pres prescriptive works of law. Uh, the argument that Islamic law was a well-oiled, self-regulating machine, a social thermostat that struck a perfect balance between consistency over time and situational innovation, while perhaps rhetorically useful, is a straw man. It's un unfalsifiable insofar as a situation in which a legal system <coughs> simply breaks down rather than accounting for a novel situation is rather absurd. 
Uh, and given that the criteria for distinguishing the enduring from the merely situational have never been firmly established. Whether or not the nature and extent of flexibility and rigidity in Islamic law can be proven in any meaningful way, what is at stake is the portrayal of Islamic law. Uh, intentionally or unintentionally characterizing the Sharia as an inherently ethical and flexible structure upheld by great men aims at another purpose that Halak makes explicit. The demonstration that the legal principles of Islamic law furnish Muslims with an indigenous, fully functioning, and just method of turning, coming to terms with change. The radical legal reforms undertaken by modernizers in the 19th and 20th centuries, according to this argument, were superfluous and destructive. Uh, the flexibility of Islamic law seems a plausible enough idea. Yet does the fact that difference of, differences of opinion existed between jurists itself make the law flexible? Moreover, what is the value in positive, positing flexibility? Uh, so certainly it seems implausible that Muslim jurists inevitably use said flexibility in a humanistic manner for the benefit of the vulnerable, much less that just outcomes were simply the product of the law itself in ways that necessarily approximated liberal conceptions of rights. A Jew from Yemen tells a story about a Muslim friend of his mother's. As this friend's husband became more and more pious, the couple quarreled more and more. Eventually, he began using, began using the phrase, I divorce you, in their arguments. And during one particularly heated one, he pronounced it three times, making the divorce official under Islamic law. Although he came to regret having said this and wanted to reconcile with her, the couple were divorced. The, Mus the woman would have to marry and consummate the marriage with the regional mahalil, uh, which is a, someone who makes things licit. An old man the writer describes as being like, quote, the, the community's stud he goat before she could remarry her first husband. The woman, who is not at all willing to bear the shame that this liaison would entail for the sake of her ex or, or not husband's carelessness in the argument refused all entreaties by the Islamic legal authorities for her to spend the night with the Mahalil. Finally a solution was reached. They decided that the spirit of the law would be fulfilled if she spent the night on the ground floor of the Mahalil's multi-story home with the bed door, bedroom door locked. Here it should be noted that it was the woman's extreme obstinacy, uh, obstinacy and not a general pro-woman stance on the part of the law or its interpreters that led the men of learning to, quote, bite into the flesh of the law and drain it of all content, as the Jew described it later. Here Islamic law did not take the side of the underdog to restore the, Islam, the existing sort of social order. The weaker party created a rupture in the social order and then used the law to negotiate a marginally better position. Anthropologist Lawrence Rosen's studies of the practice of Islamic law reflect the realist ethos and their focus on the Muslim judge as a middleman who assesses the consequences of a given legal outcome on the social relationships of the participants in a given proceeding. Rosen took pains to show that judges solved problems in line with cultural assumptions, which, while broadly accepted, were not necessarily fair. For example, in Morocco, uh, uh, marrying a girl with a bad reputation to a, a, a black suitor as opposed to a, a someone else. Um, uh, where, where Rosen, yeah, this, so they're, they're not necessarily fair, but we don't find any such qualification in Halak's interpretation of Rosen. Uh, uh, where Rosen says that the Muslim court aimed to mend ruptures in the social fabric, Halak goes on to specify that this fabric, quote, demanded a moral logic of social equity. Such an interpretation denies a place to those who, like the woman in the previous story, or the Jewish lawyers uh, who I write about, deliberately use the Sharia as a tool to rend the social fabric, or who, in a more general sense, did not necessarily want to return to the social roles, that, exactly the same social roles that they, that they uh, had before the uh, beginning of the legal proceeding. Uh, a poor Jewish woman from a small village in Yemen was known for being exceptionally stubborn and litigious. One morning she burned wood in her stove in order to bake bread. This, the wood was not very good and it gave off a lot of smoke, much, much of which wafted into the village synagogue next door. 
The rabbi, with whom she had clashed before, threatened to issue a ban of excommunication against her if she did not put the fire out. The narrator of this anecdote says that when the rabbi made this threat, quote, she leapt from where she was sitting like a lioness, stood in front of him, prepared for battle, and with her sooty face said, I am taking you to the Muslim judge. She left the bread to burn in the oven, traveled to the provincial capital, and convinced the governor to send three soldiers with her back to the village. The rabbi had to feed the soldiers well and pay them for their effort. The forcible billeting of hun hungry soldiers was a staple in the ru ruler's arsenal of coercion. The next day, the woman, the rabbi, and the soldiers traveled back to the court. When the woman complained that the rabbi had excommunicated her unjustly, the rabbi countered that the woman was by nature rebellious towards male authority, and the judge ordered the two Jews to split the fee for the soldiers and advised the woman, do what your learned men say and listen to them. While the rabbi suffered financially for his harsh judgment, the judge accepted his argument that the woman was a rebel. Oh, it's called a nashiza in Arabic. Making her an unworthy candidate on whose behalf the judge might challenge the authority of the Jewish religious establishment. While the woman had reason to believe that she would find a fair minded third party in the Muslim court, this judge conformed to Rosen's paradigm for Muslim judges' decisions. He restored the litigants to the social position they occupied before the outbreak of the dispute. Indeed, in a similar case involving litigants from the same village, a Jew who had slaughtered a cow without having received the proper certification as a kosher slaughterer protested his excommunication, but the governor upheld the rabbi's authority and punished the butcher. Legal formalists criti criticized legal realists as uh, adopting progressive Political, polit uh, pr progressive political positions and trying to pass them off as some sort of method. Indeed, the American legal realist tradition splintered into a number of divergent methods in the study of the law, among them critical legal studies, detailed empirical analysis, particularly of the political party affiliation of those who appoint judges and their putative effect on judicial decision making, an ethnographical law in action approach. According to the legal theorist Hanok Dagan, the perpetual and irre irreconcilable conflict between power and reason is the central, quote, constitutive tension of the realist conception of the law. The point is made best by Carl Llewellyn, who describes legal proceedings as, quote, a struggle for power, which nevertheless has as its concurrent aim the struggle also to persuade relevant persons that such capture will serve the common weal. The judicial politics of Yemen in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s were volatile, and the Muslim ruler, who was assassinated in 1948, had a very tumultuous relationship with the judiciary. The judge responsible for cases involving the Jews of Sana'a was, by many accounts, quite corrupt. So why did the ruler, who otherwise sought to clean up graft in the judicial system, tolerate this? The judge was related to one of the most prominent members of the opposition, and, in, and to, the, to the ruler. And in, in at least one crucial instance, the judge assisted in infiltrating an opposition circle and gathering intelligence on the ruler's enemies. Many judges, in turn, played another delicate balancing act, maintaining friendly relations with the ruler, but also c cultivating relationships with those likely to succeed him should he die in office, and stirring up disaffection in secret. <clears throat> Thus, the ruler could use the Jewish fixers, whose loyalty was less tenuous than that of his Muslim clients, to rein in, weaken, or simply get a glimpse of the cards held by a politically ambitious judge. Alternatively, a judge could point to an uppity Jew who the ruler showed, to whom the ruler showed favor as a way of fomenting outrage among conservative Muslims. I found the realist insight that cultural, political, economic, and interpersonal factors themselves may shed as much or more light on the actual functioning of a legal system than do prescriptive uh, uh, legal works to be amply justified as well. Though each of the three Jewish fix fixers portrays himself as a maverick, they were able to manipulate ambiguities within the law 
and within wider non-legal codes that help define the relationship between Muslim majority and Jewish minority. Insofar as other Muslims and Jews alternatively maintained and transgressed these borders between Jew and Muslim, they were not unique, but represented particularly skillful players in a game whose rules encompass not only substantive law and political dynamics, but also unspoken social, sartorial, and even culinary norms. Yemen was and is a tribal society and under the tribal code of honor, which differs in significant ways from Islamic law, beating up a Jew or another socially weak person, like a woman, uh, 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 somebody who's, who's uh, under the protection of one's family, a male under pr the protection of one's family, was considered shameful. Nevertheless, Muslims and Jews occasionally came to blows. For me, a more surprising discovery than this were the seemingly many instances where a Jew beat up a Muslim and, then, and when there were no witnesses. Since being beaten by a Jew was inherently very embarrassing, it seems that Jews were sometimes able to beat up Muslims, safe in the knowledge that said Muslims would never tell the authorities. And they were able to sort of parlay this implicit threat into uh, uh, various types of concessions in the, in the, in the legal, legal sphere. Uh, Jews in the Islamic State were meant to wear distinctive clothing and grow side locks, uh, peyote. Uh, uh, though they monopolized gunsmithing, gun decorating, gunpowder making, and spent cartridge recycling, theoretically they could not bear firearms or wear the tribesman's customary dagger. Yet in practice, such boundaries were observed with far more strictness in cities than in the rural areas where most Jews lived. One Muslim notable from a remote region tried to impress a visiting officer in 1905 by holding a small target in his hand while local Jews shot, it, shot at it for, from a long distance with rifles. Uh, if even the Jews around here are crack shots, though he seemed to be saying, you, you, should, you better watch out for us because we really don't have to shoot. Um, when one such country Jew traveled to Sana'a in 1936 for a business trip, uh, he left... He took off the dagger and turban that he wore at home, changed his clothes for a modest Jewish outfit, tucked his long hair under a cap, leaving only a lock exposed on each side, and rode side saddle on a donkey. I looked at myself and saw that I was a different creature, he writes. He says that Muslims in Sana'a went out of their way to curse, raise their staffs as if to strike, throw rocks at, and pull him off his donkey. When he was ready to leave and a guard at the gate of the Jewish quarter demanded he wait to have his bags checked for alcohol, he could take it no longer. He changed back into his tribal clothing, girded on his dagger, let his long hair flow, put on his magnificent turban, mounted his donkey with legs impudently splayed on either side. Then he went to the no another gate, wrapped on it with his staff, and demanded to be let out quote, in the manner of a free man. Uh, uh, there were there was a, a lot of there were a lot of instances. So, so there were certain certain ways in which people people dressed or wore their hair in order to distinct to distinguish Jews and Muslims. But then there were everybody was aware that there were circumstances when uh, all you needed to do was get a certain haircut or change your clothes, and you could pass for for the other uh, group. And there were there were examples of both both things happening. Uh, in, Ye uh, in Yemen, as in our country, much court business took place over a cup of coffee or a meal. Among tribesmen, sharing a meal created a temporary ceasefire in a feud, and the slaughter of animals offered restitution for a variety of misdeeds, according to the animals. So, like, slaughtering a bull was a, was a, was a big deal for something serious. Uh, in the context of the dietary laws, this, this posed unique challenges to uh, Jewish litigants. Uh, in Yemen, drinking meat broth, uh, non-kosher meat broth, would irrevocably finalize a Jew's conversion to Islam. Even there's a story of someone who uh, fell ill and was taken in, by, in a Muslim's house and he was barely conscious and he was nursed back to health on chicken broth. And then, they said, oh. and then he came back and said, oh, you're a Muslim now, you've been drinking that chicken broth. Um, uh, 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 so, so in order to avoid this, uh, Shlomo de Goitain says that traveling Jewish craftsmen 
carry, uh, the, the traveling Jewish craftsman carried with him the indispensable coffee cup in a little basket fastened by a strap of leather to his bag of tools. So this allowed the Jew to avoid making use of a Muslim's cups, which may have contained meat soup. Again, such, ta such taboos would have been more stringently observed in urban areas. Uh, the Bedouin, whose hospitali hospitality was the stuff of legend, might hire a kosher butcher just to be able to honor a Jewish guest with a meal of mutton. One Jew recalls an instance when a Muslim brought a rabbi a sheep to slaughter and split it in two. Uh, the Muslim kept half for himself, and the Jew, the Jews who brought their own kitchenware came to his home to feast on the other half. When it came to dairy products, some rabbis were quite permissive when it came to Gentile milk and cheese. Uh, although there is exam an example of one particularly uh, observant uh, Jewish pietist who uh, was not, not convinced that the Muslim cheese was actually kosher, so he, he, there were some Muslims who helped him make kosher cheese with uh, fig, fig sap instead of um, rennet. So, um, one Muslim who was imprisoned for his opposition to the ruler recalls sharing a prison cell with three Jews who had been jailed because, quote, they cultivated their knowledge and inclined towards emancipation. Since prisoners were responsible for feeding themselves at their own expense or their family's expense, the Muslims suggested that the cellmates all dine together. The Jews refused since the meat was not kosher. The Muslims said to one of the Jews, you call for emancipation, yet you are gripped by a reactionary idea. We are the sons of one homeland, and we have both called for freedom. The Jew replied, yes, that is correct. We will eat everything equally, except for the meat. <laughs> Not at all, said the Muslim. We will eat everything as equals, including the meat. Agreed, said the Jew. When the food was procured, quote, we ate equally after mixing their food with our food. Other Muslims in the jail disapproved of this radical act of interreligious eating. Um, of course, these prisoners uh, were envisioning a very different utopia than the one that was uh, exemplified by Sharia. Uh, for them, Arab nationalism, with its eclectic blend of progressive rhetoric and strong state apparatus, would presumably level the playing field between Muslim and Jew. Uh, in Yemen, this order was only put into place after a long civil war, protracted civil war involving regional powers, and has been up upended in Yemen and elsewhere uh, during and after the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, Jews in Yemen tended to vote with their feet, uh, unwilling to bet on either the promises of Arab nationalism or the road not taken suggested by the three Jewish fixers themselves, a reformed Islamic law, they elected to leave the country en masse. Was this a calculated embrace of Zionist ethnic nationalism or a messianic religious movement? Were they economic refugees? The various factors are so thoroughly intertwined as to be almost impossible to, 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 to un untangle. One such Jew writes, the hard life, paucity of rain, drought, diseases, epidemics, and plagues made Yemen, quote, a land which is cut off, Eretz Gezerah, which is from Leviticus, and a bitter exile, uh, not only for Jews, but for all of the non-Jewish population. Anxiety over physical subsistence, bread to eat, supporting oneself honorably and without degradation, pursued a person until the day he died. This is the real world that, most, that unfortunately most people in the Middle East faced then and also now. Uh, legal realists, according to Victoria Norris and Gregory Schaefer, quote, embrace the value of individual liberty while critically grounding this concept in a real world perspective of human vulnerability and mutual, mutual interdependence. Uh, <coughs> it is probably not in my power to convince scholars of Islamic law that the, uh, the fantasy of tearing down the oppressive edifice of modernity and human rights ought to be at least postponed, uh, uh, if not abandoned altogether. Never, nevertheless, that I, I can express my hope that this uh, uh, that, uh, turn from this, this kind of 
uh, meta narrative, as, as Leotard would have called it, to uh, a more hands on approach that's cognizant of the, the actual lived realities of, of people. Uh, in, the, in their interactions with the, the legal system will become the norm rather than the exception. Uh, thank you.